Hello friends. I wanted to talk to you about service sales, so selling services like coaching, training, consultancy, and what's fundamentally wrong with almost everything that you're reading about service sales and, and what these sales gurus, experts are trying to sell you in terms of their you know, sales coaching programs, their marketing programs. You probably, like me, getting um, multiple LinkedIn connections every week from people offering to uh, generate sales leads for coaching, people offering to generate you know, six figures in income. Uh, I don't know what currency that's in for uh, for coaches by generating sales leads through their fantastic, unique, proven, whatever um, lead generation program, which is all a load of rubbish. And um, I'm just going to explain to you what's wrong with the, the approach that these people are taking and what's wrong with most of what you're going to read on the Internet about sales and um, and what you need to do instead. So the reason I'm telling you this is because I've been uh, a coach, consultant, trainer, um, leadership and management uh, expert for about 18 years now. Uh, what are we, 20, 20? Yeah, 18 years coming up to. And before that, I worked in the telecoms and IT industry. And uh, the most uh, recent jobs that I had in that industry was selling services, managed services and outsourcing. I'm not talking about coaching packages of a you know few hundred or a few thousand pounds. I'm talking about multi-million pound outsourced and managed service deals. So uh, I understand selling services pretty well. And, um, and we sold products as well, electronic and technology products. Um, so I understand how product and service sales work. And I think uh, the vast majority of people um, claiming expertise in sales are probably talking about you know, commodity and uh, consumer goods and retail sort of sales, which is absolutely not the same thing at all. Um, and just uh, just in this last week, I saw an advert pop up on Facebook for um, some fantastic public speaking sales guru uh, offering a free webinar where he's going to share all his secrets to um, how you can develop a you know a fantastic sales platform and a, and a you know public speaking platform and so on without having to be famous or a big brand name or, or have a best selling book or an established client base or anything like that. And it was a mock webinar. It wasn't really a webinar. It was you sign up for the webinar and all the webinars starting in four minutes. And it's just a recorded webinar. But the way that it's set up is to make it look as if you're signing up to a, a live webinar. And it isn't. It's just a video that is made that just get it gets trotted out to everybody who signs up to it. And it's part of a sales funnel. And if you don't know what a sales funnel is, it's basically um, it's, it's actually part of every sales cycle for every business in the world, which is fundamentally simple observation that more people are going to talk to you or look at your product than are going to buy it so you know if you've got 10 people let's say you've got a, a shop um, 10 people walk into the shop but only one person buys something um, and we we calculate the difference at each stage of the circle uh, the cycle and we call that the conversion rate so your overall conversion rate in your shop is 10 percent because 10 percent of the customers who 10 customers who come in one person buys that's your conversion rate. And what we do is we break that decision process down into a number of steps and we look at what's the conversion rate at each one. So if 20 people walked past the shop, but only 10 people came in, there's 50%. If 10 people looked around the shop, but only five actually went to a specific item and looked at a specific item, we've got 50% again. And then we go from the five that looked at a specific item to the one that bought it, we've got a, you know, what's that, a 20% uh, conversion ratio. So we look at each stage and we look at what can we do to increase the conversion rate at each stage of the sales cycle. We're not trying to sell to everybody because um, that's just not feasible. And there's people around who say, uh, for example, coaching. Coaching is amazing. It's fantastic. It's transformational. It's magical. You know, everybody's potentially a, a, in the world is a, a client for coaching. Well, yeah, kind of. But not really, because um, you know the majority of people are, are solving the the underlying uh, problems that they have in in other ways. So you know, realistically, not everybody's going to buy the service, and not everybody's going to buy the service from you. That's just a, that's just a fact. 
So um, the way that this guy's funnel worked was you sign up for this mock webinar um, and then on the end of that you can book a free consultancy call but there's of course there's only a few available and you're going to be you know if you act quickly you might be one of the lucky people to get that and then after the consultancy call they decide if you're the kind of client that that you want that they want sorry uh, meaning you know have you got some money to spend and uh, and then they sign you up to this ridiculously expensive program which i think was about nine thousand pounds something like that for a coaching program which is ludicrous um and so fundamentally what's wrong with sales uh stuff that you that you're going to read online is it's all based around product sales because product sales is what most salespeople are involved in it's what most salespeople do it's what most people experience as buyers because most of the time we're buying things rather than services or at least we we think we are i'll come on to that later so most People are trained. Most sales books you will ever read are written from the perspective of product sales. They're not written about service sales and coaching as a service. And service sales is fundamentally different to product selling and you cannot approach them in the same way. The fundamental difference between product sales and service sales is to do with the balance of risk. So at every point in the sales cycle, the customer is going to make a decision. Do I go into the shop? Do I look at a specific product? Do I pick it up? Do I ask questions about it? Is this the one that I want? Do I want to pay this amount of money for it? All these sorts of things. Each decision that the customer makes is a, is a step in the sales process. And at each of those steps, the, the risk that the customer is taking has to balance um, the the reason for this is because we want to feel safe and comfortable about decisions commitments that we're making i'm going to spend some money on this is it is it going to be giving me what i want is it going to do the job that i want it to do if we go to a restaurant or a you know a supermarket and you're picking something up and looking at it you're thinking oh, well how much is it is it going to give me what i want is it you know is it going to be what i like and and so on um is it going to meet my needs fundamentally <clears throat> so um in a product sale, the balance of risk is on the salesperson. So the customer takes no risk at all, thanks to consumer protection laws. So if you go to a shop and you buy, I don't know, a certain part for your computer or accessory for your car or, you know, a picture for your house or an ornament or something like that, um, there are laws that say that if it is not, if it doesn't conform to the you know, the, the specifications that the, the retailer says, um, then you can take it back. Um, if it doesn't do what you wanted it to do, you can take it back. If it's broken, you can take it back. And actually, for most retailers, we'll take that a step further, that if it just isn't for you, you get it home and you think, you know, it's the wrong colour or it's the wrong size or it's not the one I thought it was or, or whatever, then you take it back. You give the product in its original saleable form back to the salesperson. The salesperson gives you your money back and you're both back where you started. You've both spent a bit of time in the sales process and in the transaction, but the point is you've spent equal time. So the risk is on the salesperson that the product is going to do what they say it's going to do. It's as simple as that. If, you, if you're selling, a, um, I don't know, a microphone or a camera or a keyboard for a computer, it's got to do what you say it's going to do. And if it doesn't, then the, the risk is on you. You give the customer back... you. The money you take back the product you can sell it to somebody else the customer can spend their money elsewhere so everyone's back where they're started and, and everyone's uh, well you know uh, pr pre pretty much happy in that respect but in a service sale it's different the risk is on the buyer so both the salesperson and the buyer will spend equal, equal time in the pre-sales conversation up to the point that the customer makes the buying decision but after that, the customer now has to expend time after they've bought consuming the service. And that service has to deliver what the customer expected it to. And so the problem there is, if it doesn't, the customer can go back to the supplier or the salesperson and say the service didn't do what I wanted it to do or what you told me it would do. The salesperson could say, uh, and you know, in most countries, again, this is protected by uh, consumer protection uh, laws. In most cases, the you know the, the the buyer could go back to the salesperson. The salesperson uh, would give the customer a refund of what they'd spent. 
but the customer is never going to get back their time. And this isn't time in the sales process pre-decision. This is time in consuming the service. That's the long bit. That's the time the customer is invested in. That's the time that the customer has spent consuming the service, expecting the service is going to give them what they want. And if it doesn't, now they're very unhappy because they've spent their time which is far more valuable than their money. The customer can always get more money, but they can't ever get any more time. So that's why in service sales, the risk is on the customer. In product sales, the risk is on the buyer. So everything you read online about products, about sales, is about product sales because it's all about influencing, pitching, figuring out customers' needs, uh, positioning the product, creating perception of value, all that sort of stuff. That's all product sales stuff. That's not service sales. So the risk is on the buyer, and if we don't take that into account, the buyer, the customer, will walk away because they don't feel comfortable making the decision. Simple as that. So when we are selling a service like coaching or training or consulting, to try and turn that into a product so that we can use a product sales methodology by what a, a lot of people uh, are doing, and you know, you look on a lot of coaches' websites, you'll see them doing this. And if you look at the <clears throat> the, com- the companies that train coaches, they're also advocating this, that you create a coaching package, uh, and it's like an off-the-shelf, there it is, that's what you get. You get this psychometric profile, you get these bunch of coaching sessions, you get this free, you know, this ebook and all this other stuff. And, and they turn it into a product, something that you can sell using product techniques, product sales techniques, but the fundamental problem is you can't sell it using uh, product sales techniques because no matter how you wrap it up, the customer still knows that what they are buying is a service and it will take their time to consume that service. It's a bit like buying a book. A book is a product, but the book only meets your needs. When you read the book, reading the book takes time. And if you've ever read a book, you know, maybe a a factual or a a, a business book, you know, that book about some sort of uh, factual thing like coaching, how to coach or how to do this or that. Um, and you three pages in and you, you're thinking this book's rubbish or it's not answering my questions, it's not giving me what I want. And you think, oh, you know, well, I've, I've started now, I better read on a bit more and a bit more. And you start to feel resentful that you've wasted time on this book that doesn't live up to the promise that was made on, on the cover. That's That's the sort of thing I'm talking about. So, Another thing that you'll see quite often that's an attempt to turn a service into a product and sell it using a product sales model is for the coach to talk about uh, the end result for the client. So to sell the end result. Um, So if you imagine, for example, if your central heating at home breaks down and you call a plumber and the plumber comes out and fixes the heating. So the end result that the plumber is selling you is a working central heating system so that you be nice and warm again. Um, But if the plumber charged you based on that end result, which is what a lot of these coaching sales experts are advocating, if the plumber charged you based on the value of the end result, they would say, well, what's it worth to you to have a, a, a warm house again? And of course, that's going to depend on the time of year. In the summer, couldn't really care less. I can I can wait. Um, in when winter's starting to set in, actually that's a big problem. And the start of October is around the time that everyone turns their central heating back on, and that's when most um, you know if your central heating system is going to fail, that's when it will do it because it's been off over the over the summer, and uh, now you've suddenly switched it back on again, and something you know is worn out or rusted or seized up or whatever. Um, But you wouldn't expect the plumber to put the prices up just because your need is greater. You would feel that that was unfair because the plumber takes the same amount of time to fix the heating system in the winter as they do in the summer. Now, if the plumber says, um, so for, uh, you know, that I can't, you know, can't get the parts because it's a busy time of year. So the parts aren't in stock. So the part prices have gone up. Um, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, you can't get the part any cheaper. Then you know, then that that you're stuck with it. But for the plumber's time, the plumber's time isn't more valuable just because they are more in demand. What that leads us to, if they were, what that leads us to is value-based pricing or demand-based pricing. Now, one of the areas where we're used to seeing this is in the airline industry. We are used to paying more for airline seats the closer we get to the departure date or the more limited uh, in availability the seats become or the more limited the flights become. 
So we used a demand-based pricing, but demand-based or value-based pricing only works if everybody in the industry is doing it. As soon as one airline says, these uh, seats are going to be this price, doesn't matter when you buy it, a year before, the day before, always the same price. What that does is it, it skews the market, it upsets the balance of the market, it changes customers' expectations. And fundamentally what we're dealing with here is customers' expectations. So as soon, so if they know that everywhere that they go, the longer they leave it, the more expensive the flights become, um, then you know they, they have an incentive to plan ahead, which is what the airlines want, because they want to, you know, they want certainty. They want money, of course, but they want certainty and you know, which helps them with scheduling and planning and crew rotors and things like that. So for the plumber to sell us the end result and to sell us the end result based on what's that worth, we wouldn't stand it because the market doesn't stand it because we know that's not how the market works. The customer understands very well the relationship between cost and time and time spent doing the work and expects the, the plumber to charge by the hour. They understand that. So as soon as one plumber starts uh, talking about value-based pricing, uh, well, if the value-based price is the same as the time price, it makes no difference anyway. It's a different terminology, but the customer's going to pay the same anyway. It's only going to make a difference to the customer if the customer pays less. The plumber doesn't want to charge any less. The plumber wants to charge more. The customer's not going to pay more if they can get the same service uh, for the for a lower price somewhere else. And, and in their mind, you know, it's the same service. A plumber, much of a muchness, they're all going to do the same job. They're all going to fix the central heating system. I'm going to end up in the in the same uh, same place. The problem with using that methodology as well from a coaching perspective is what what is the end result that the coach is selling for the plumber it's you you know it's a, a warm house for the for the coach it's what it's the client's future self how does the coach guarantee what that's going to look like so if I was a plumber and I come to your house to fix your central heating system I will be able to say I can guarantee that I will get this working for you what I don't know yet is how long it's going to take and what it's going to cost. So the first thing I do is open the thing up, I have a look, find out what the problem is, and I say, right, so it's this pump has seized up, the pump needs to be replaced, they cost this much amount of money, it's going to take me this amount of time to do it, because I know how to do it, I've done it before, I know how long it takes, and therefore the cost for me repairing your central heating system is going to be this amount. Coach can't say that. A coach can't say you, your future self, with your new job or your new career or your new relationship or your happy, fantastic life. Um, I, I've done it before, and because the reality is you, you haven't. You know, central heating boiler of the same make and, and model. They are designed to be identical, interchangeable parts. You know, once the plumbers figured out or have been on the training course to learn one, they've learned them all, and they could probably figure out other similar boilers and systems as well. But with a human being, that's not the case because we are unique. And although, you know, your experience of working with people tells you that there are common and consistent patterns and issues that come up for people, the way each person achieves that, the way each person certainly thinks about that is, is absolutely unique. So no coach can guarantee an end result. Well, if they do guarantee the end result, they can't say how long it's going to take and, and so on. They can say, well, you know, this type of thing, you know, creating step change, starting your own business. I find it normally takes people about six months to a year. I find they need this amount of support and so on. So you can make an estimate, you can make a guess, but you can't, you know, absolutely guarantee it in, in the way that you can when you're, you know, servicing a boiler or servicing a car or something like that. So selling the end result, selling the, the, the client's future self is problematic because as the coach, now you're making a guarantee, a promise, which you can't necessarily live up to. And that creates problem with the dissatisfaction of the service and the fact that you can't, you know, you can't give the, the client their time back. And we're back to the same fundamental problem with service sales. Um, value based pricing is the basis of things like spin selling if you've come across that which is a fiercely protected trademarked sales system created by Neil Rackham back in the 80s I think or 90s um, but it, it doesn't create value based pricing value based sales models are not about value based pricing they're about creating perceived value in order to justify capital spend so if you're going to a company and selling them you know a bunch of new photocopiers that are going to cost this amount of money um, you'd use a value-based sales model 
to enable the customer or to support the customer in creating a financial business case that makes that a, a sensible purchasing decision. But it doesn't change the price of what you're selling them. It changes the perceived value of what you're selling them. That's fundamentally different. You're not changing the value, the price. You're not changing the price of your coaching services based on <coughs> the value to the client. The perceived value to the client is giving them more of an incentive to buy your services, but the price isn't changing. So um, the customer understands very well the relationship between uh, cost and time, and they understand the relationship between value and cost and time, and they understand when a market uh, has a value-based pricing model, like the airline network, and they understand when it has a, a, a value-based sales model, like um, you know selling business-to-business -business services, that sort of thing. So um, if you're trying to sell coaching, you are selling a service. And if you fo focus on the value only of the end result, if you focus only on this is where you're going to get at the end of this uh, program of coaching, what you're actually doing inadvertently is you're diminishing the value of the delivery of the service. So you are actually diminishing your own value by putting the focus on the end result. And therefore, you know, I recommend strongly that you, you don't do that. Um, and it's a product sales approach and that just doesn't work anyway. So if we go back to product sales, actually, it's, it's not quite as simple as differentiating between product and service sales, because every product sale has an element of service wrapped around it. Um, so every product that you buy is differentiated, has value added by some aspect of service. So, for example, um, next day shipping, uh, ease of buying, interest-free credit, um, custom options like you can choose colours. Like with a car, you know, you can choose the colour that you want and the interior that you want and the different options and so on. And then what gets delivered from the factory is, is customised to your requirements within the the small scope of options that they give you but that's a value add because it allows you to to have a car that that's better suited to your individual tastes um, even the expertise of the salesperson is part of the service if the salesperson is is uh, adding value by helping you with the decision helping you to make the right decision by uh, you know discussing options or by you know giving you information about the product and those sorts of things um, all of these, all of these things, like you know, next day shipping and the, the you know the value, the the expertise of the salesperson, they all cost money to provide, and because they cost money to provide, the 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 company, the supplier, has to recoup that money somehow, and so they're using those services to add value to a product. So if you're looking at two identical products, say on on eBay or Amazon or whatever, one is you'll get it in two or three days, the other is next day delivery, and they're the same price, <clears throat> you'll go for the next day delivery one because it's a, you know, it's more valuable. Even if you don't need it the next day, you'll still go for the next day option because the perceived value is higher. And actually, you know, the, the, a, big, a big supplier that's got, uh, you know, a discount deal with the postal service, it may not cost them any more than the two or three day delivery that the other person, the other supplier is offering. But still, the perceived value to you is higher, so that's one that you'll go for. So um, the fundamental principle of sales is not influencing, it's not product knowledge, it's not cold calling, it's not closing, it's understanding risk. And at every decision point in the sales process, or the sales cycle as it's sometimes called, the buyer will only move forward when the risks balance. When the risks don't balance, the buyer will, will stop or they'll exit the sales conversation altogether. You can think of it like a, like a canal boat. If you've ever seen a canal boat going up or down a hill, um, because water tends to um, you know, run away when you, when you have it on a hill, a uh, canal surface of a canal that the boat's travelling along is always flat. Um, so the, 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 when, a, when a canal boat needs to go up or down hills, they, they use a series of locks, and the lock creates a series of steps that um, allows the you know the, the people in the boat to equalize the water levels before and after the boat and then the boat can move forward so the boat will only move forward when the water levels are equal it can't do otherwise and um, and just like uh, just like the, the boat moving forwards or backwards through the through the series of locks um, 
the buyer can only move forward when the risks balance and the buyer doesn't feel comfortable when they don't. So when the risk is high compared to where the customer is currently, the customer will stay where they are. And when the risk is too low compared to where the customer is now, um, I'm sure you've had the feeling occasionally when you've been looking at something or talking to maybe a salesperson about a particular thing, you've had the feeling that something is too good to be true. And that puts you off. You, you puts you off because it just doesn't seem right. That for that price or for the, no, I, I no, I don't like it. We don't feel comfortable. We feel comfortable when the balance uh, when the the balance of risks is is equal, not when it's more or less in our favour. Um, so in service sales, remember the fundamental risk to the customer is time. You can't balance the client's risk by offering their money back because their money can be replaced. Their time can't. The time is the only thing that they're investing that has real value to them. So during the sales process, as I said earlier, the salesperson, the buyer or the coach and the client are making an equal investment in time because we're both party to the conversations that we're having. But after the customer makes the decision, that's when all the risk is on them. And that's the bit that they're worried about. They don't want to take that risk. So how do they balance that risk? How do they balance that risk by feeling good about the service that they're buying, that it's going to deliver what they want? And the answer actually is surprisingly simple. And it's the same as what you do now when you make yourself comfortable with an unfamiliar journey. So let's say you've got to go somewhere that you've never been before and you've got to be there exactly at a certain time, it's like an interview or a you know, ceremony of some, some sort, whatever it might be. You've got to be there on time. You've never been there before. You don't know what travel situation's like. You don't know what the parking is going to be like, you know, how close it is, you know, or the station, all of these unknowns. What do you do? It's very simple, isn't it? You do research. You look on maps. You look at timetables. You look at guidebooks. You look online and you look at, you know, you get look on Google Street View and you look at the, you know, the the road outside the place and you think well you know can i can how do i get there and how close do i park and how long do i need to to leave to get from where i park to where the place is and so on so you familiarize yourself based on as much other information as you can find if you're planning a holiday you you know you look at guidebooks you you look at maps you look at reviews online and you you look at other people's photos and you try and familiarize yourself so basically what you're doing is you are creating a mental map of the journey so that when you travel, when you make that journey for real, it won't be exactly how you've imagined it, but it'll be close enough that you will feel safe navigating. You'll feel safe getting there. You know, you'll arrive and you'll think, oh, yeah, I recognize this. I looked on the map and I, you know, there's that church I saw and there's that retail park that was on the map. I recognize this and I can go and you know, you don't know exactly what parking space you're going to end up in, but you know where the car park is, you know, you know, how long it's going to take you to walk to the place. You know, if it's going to rain, you, you've taken an umbrella or you've taken a coat, you've planned ahead. Planning ahead is about creating a mental map that contains um, detailed expectations that are going to help you to navigate in real life. And that's that this is the, the key or the clue to selling a service. In a service sale, what you're doing is you're helping the client to create a detailed map of what that journey is going to be look like. Uh, look like. So when they're traveling that journey with you, they will know, they will get the feeling that they are on the right track. That I don't understand everything that this person's doing for me, with me, to me, whatever. I don't understand the relevance of every coaching question that they're going to ask. I don't understand the relevance of this profile thing they've asked me to fill out. But I understand that this matches my expectation closely enough that I'm going to go with it. I'm going to trust this person uh, to lead me on this journey and to see where where it takes me. And so what we're doing is we're creating a sense of, uh, of certainty and security and safety by balancing the risk, by creating a detailed enough map of the journey that the client can imagine going on that journey with us. And at any point on that journey, they can check in and think, right, am I roughly where I thought I was going to be? Is this turning out roughly how I expected it to turn out? It's not about creating a compelling destination. So here's another thing that the coaching the sales guru is going to tell you that you've got to create this amazing, compelling destination. You're going to, you know, what, you know, if you do this coaching program with me, you're going to have this amazing life and you're going to have your own business. You're going to be a millionaire. It's going to be fantastic. You're going to have a 
house in the Bahamas and your boat and your private jet and all this sort of nonsense, which is exactly what they do, which is an old timeshare selling trick. So if you've ever been to a timeshare presentation, they show you pictures of people who have made a lot of money selling timeshares. So, you know, with their with their timeshares, they're in their happy things and their, you know, big uh, boats and their big houses that they're standing in front of or piles of money or whatever it is. And so the, um, the, the these if we create a compelling destination, we're trying to convince the client that the end result is going to be so good, it's worth taking a journey that you know nothing about. It's worth taking a journey into the unknown because the end result is going to be that amazing. The problem is it's not like, uh, you know, going on an amazing uh, holiday to some fantastic destination. You don't really know how you're going to get there. Um, but you kind of, you know, you think, well, I'll work it out along the way because you've seen photos. Um, you know that that place exists. You know that that amazing scenery or that beautiful sunset or the, you know, the mountains or the, the hotel or whatever it is. You know it exists. You've seen pictures. Other people have been there. It's real right now. But the client's future self is not real. The future doesn't exist anywhere. And if they're showing you pictures of other people, that's not you. And so if the, you know, if, if you're creating this compelling future for the client, straight away you are setting unrealistic expectations because you do not know that that is possible for the client. So that's the first problem. You're creating an expectation that you cannot deliver on that will create dissatisfaction and that will unbalance the risks and that will stop the customer from moving forward, stop the client from buying the service. But there's a second and there's a far more, uh, perhaps more important point about this, this idea of creating a compelling destination for the client. And that's very simply this. You don't have to because they've already done it. They've already done it because they're talking to you about it. So they already know what they expect the destination to be. Otherwise, they wouldn't be having a conversation with you about how you're going to help them to get there. So you don't have to create that. They already know what that is. What you have to do is create a sense of safety and predictability in the journey that you're going to take to get there. Um, and so that's talking about how the process is going to work, how what kind of questions you're going to ask, what kind of homework you're going to get them to do, what they can expect, the ups and downs that they can expect, the, the times when... Um, you know, they can go away with some great idea about something they're going to try out and then they experience disappointment in, in real life when they when they try out their idea or they go and do their homework or, you know, they feel like they've made some change but nobody else cares or they meet resistance from their families and friends and so on. By spelling that journey out for them, not saying, oh, it's going to be amazing and empowering and transformational. Yeah, yeah, I get that. That's why we're having the conversation. What I want to know now is, what is it really going to be like? When is it going to hurt? What are the, what can I expect? What do I need to do? What do I need to commit to? So the more honestly um, you can help the client to fill in and create detail in that mental map of the journey, the more you're balancing those risks, the more likely the client is to move forward and at least start that journey with you. And you can't guarantee where that journey leads to and, and you can't guarantee it for them. You can only guarantee what you will do in pursuit of that end result. And the reason for that is because that person is not a mass produced car or a computer or a central heating boiler. They are a unique human being, a unique person. And ultimately in in uh, you know in in everything in coaching counseling all of these uh, you know training uh, and consulting all of these sorts of practices and these services ultimately the end result the client gets is down to them and and their ability to put in practice and to create change and to create change in the system that's around them and so on your job is to provide that service to the best of your ability and if you're doing that from from the perspective of any kind of experience, you've got any experience providing that service, then you know the kind of things that happen. You know the times and it gets a little bit sticky, it gets a little bit you know, un, uh, un, unpleasant for the, for the client. You know that they're going to have some early wins and you know that they're going to have some setbacks as well. And if you're honest about that, then you, you're helping them to create a mental map of the journey that lets them feel at least safe about taking the first step. And that's all that we can ask for. 
And so that's fundamentally what we have to do when we are selling any service. And now you can see why that is totally different to selling any sort of product where you can say, here's the thing, here's the product. If it doesn't do what you want, bring it back, have your money back or have a voucher or or get an, you know, exchange it for a different one or, or whatever you like. Everyone's back where they started. Everyone's happy. Not the case with the service business. So, um, so uh, you know, take that in, uh, you know, it, and add it to you know your own experiences and what's what's working for you of course but um hopefully you'll see some um some parallels and some some relevance in some of the stuff you've seen online about sales and maybe being been skeptical about um and um uh, and good luck and uh and and happy selling thanks for watching